Thank you. And thank you, Amandeep, for organizing all of us and for everything that you do to increase the, our culture understanding and giving us a chance to talk about history, our shared history. Um, and I think, you know, this is certainly one of the upsides of lockdown that we've been able to do this. So really thank you from all of us and welcome everyone who is joining us. I can see 188 people. That's really wonderful. Um, I work at the BBC. I have just written a book um, about partition. It's called Partition Voices. And that was very much looking at the experiences of people who live through partition in Britain and hadn't talked about it. And one of my uh, absolute go-to books is um, Anshul's. And I, I feel, and I've said this to her before, I feel like it's they're kind of twins. It's just that they're twins who live on the other side of the world. And I, and when I read this book, I feel so many of the emotions that I felt when I wrote my book. Um, so welcome Anshul from Delhi. A little bit of introduction about um, Anshul Mahotra. She's an artist, um, which you can tell from the beautiful pictures that she's taken that feature in her Wonderful book. This is the Indian version of the book, but I'm sure Anshul will show you the um, yeah. European version too. So not only is she uh, an artist, she is an oral historian, and she is the co-founder of the Museum of Material Memory. Um, but we are going to discuss her book, Remnants of the Separation, and it looks at the very painful division of the Indian subcontinent, but it looks at it through a really original lens and it's through material objects and the objects that people carried with them and it's a very poignant book it is beautifully written um so Anshul thank you for being with us thank you for that very kind introduction um so I want to really start by something you call things and you say that you know the word for things in so many different languages, but what you mean are material objects, which is the subject of your book. Why did you choose to talk about material objects uh, in a way to discuss partition? I mean, I think I've got that question a lot, why things? And in the preface, I did write that I can say things in many languages because I would go to people's houses and ask for things. And it may seem strange because there's so much memory still alive from that time. And yet you're going to someone's house and asking them for things. So why the thing? When I started this work, I was 23. And there was so much distance between not just me and the event, but also me and the people I was interviewing. And I remember the very first time that the idea for this project struck me was when someone brought out two objects they had carried from Lahore to Amritsar. They were a ghada, uh, uh, in which lassi is made, and a guz, a yardstick to measure fabric. And when they were talking about them and touching them and just generally telling us about these things, they just went back to their childhood in Lahore. And I didn't, I mean, of course, old objects do that. You know, aged things, heirlooms. Why do we hold heirlooms so dear? Because they remind us of another place and time, a person who gave them to us. But I just, I think in my head, I couldn't imagine an object taking you across such an impenetrable border to the other side of the border. And it made me think that if one person is so moved by mere things, mundane things, are other people also as moved? And what did they bring? Because I think that one of the things about partition that we are told is that people left in such a hurry that they didn't really take anything with them. And surely enough, in my first few interviews, it was a lot of kuchne life. Hey, we didn't take anything. There was no time. We left in the middle of the night. But then eventually, people did bring things. And they did take out things from the backs of their closets. It's really incredible things that I will show you later in the presentation. But I think the thing about things is that they paint a kind of ethnographic or social life of people. And when we study partition, we need to understand that partition didn't just, and you know this better than anybody, Kurita, partition didn't happen on August 14 and 15, 1947. It's not limited to those two days. It happened over the course of months, and it, some would argue years. It took months to normalize. It took months to occur. A division didn't happen overnight. Just how enemies 
quote unquote, weren't made overnight. So I think the thing about the object is that it teaches you about how people live and how people live together. And what you're trying to build is a social ethnography of a time before partition. This is the, the basis of my study, a uh, study of, of people and their lives. Um, you say that material memory works in mysterious ways. How is material memory different from memory? And, and what is so mysterious? Well, an object is an inanimate thing. It cannot speak. It cannot move. It doesn't remember anything. So anything we feel for an object is deposited into it by people. And we've seen this with us a million times. We hold something old and we literally can feel the time that it came from. We know the people that once wore it or used it or gave it to us. Material memory hides in all kinds of things. And we deposit parts of ourselves into objects without even realizing. I'll give you a classic example. With some of the objects that people carried, if they were very mundane, they didn't really care so much about them. Say it was a small pocket knife or a book or a textbook from their college. But over the course of two, three hours that we talked, we continued to infuse it with importance and memory and time and landscape and geography. At the end of our conversation, if I proposed borrowing it, oh, can I wear this ring and see how it looks? Can I take this book for my research and return it back to you? They would almost always say no. They would say, no, it belongs to me. And, and so the shift from nonchalance to proprietorship happened so quickly over the course of you know, those two, three hours that I think this is what material memory is. It kind of um, it chances upon you when you least expect it, you know? And you say that they act as this stimulus for recollection. What is it about objects that can do that, especially when you're talking about something as traumatic as partition and certainly something where people may not have actually articulated the words before or said them out loud? What is it that an object can do to stir those memories? Is it... Is it difficult or easier to talk about partition with an object? I don't know. I don't know if we can generalize this, but I know that when I started, I was young and I needed an in. It was, it was too hard for me to go up to someone and just ask, I heard you live through partition. Tell me about it. I had never witnessed it. I may never witness it in my life. I, I can only, everything I have, will always be a secondhand, a borrowed experience because I'm always trying to empathize with the person. But I noticed that with the object, um, when the object is in someone's hands, people have a sort of stream of consciousness going on. They're talking about the thing. So say for example, if they're talking about a certificate, a college certificate, then talking about that college certificate, they may remember the day in college, where their exam was cancelled because of partition riots. Now, this is a very direct example. All other gave to her daughter can spur a memory that a father told her about partition happening. Or let's say someone carried a radio that would tell you whether or not they were wealthy enough to have a radio. Whether someone read something in a newspaper would tell you whether they were literate enough to have a newspaper, what language they read, and how they learned about partition. I use the object as a catalyst. It's an aid because I know that our conversation goes beyond the object. It's obviously not limited to the landscape and the periphery of the object, but it's a good place to begin. The object is also, um, it's borderless. You know, it's a democratic space. Um, there are so many different types of objects that you yeah. talk about in your book. So there are the objects that people took and often, you know, people didn't have time to, to take things. They, they did go in a hurry. And sometimes they went uh, back for their objects. And sometimes, really interestingly, it was second and third mm -hmm. generations who wanted to preserve these objects. Um, I think it would be really wonderful if you could just talk through some of these objects and, and just mm -hmm. tell us what they told about that experience of partition. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, they're objects that people took. They're objects that they wish that they had taken. 
And then there are also objects, as you say, uh, second and third generations carried. So I'm going to share my screen now. And can you see it? Yes, wonderful. Okay, perfect. And we're going to go through very quickly, like a broad list of the kinds of things that people carry. Uh, okay, so photographs, of course, people loved carrying photographs and they're all different kinds um, and all different stories with them, of course. Uh, then jewelry, people always carry things that they could sell, things that they could uh, mortgage, things that could be used as collateral. This is my own grandmother's jewelry that's on the cover of the Indian edition of the book. They carried money, of course, uh, gold and silver. They carried all kinds of coins. And actually, just on money, this was really the the beginnings of your when your when your grandmother told was your grandmother told you the five rupee story. Yeah. So for her, I mean, her father died at a very young age, and so she was left in this big family, her really with her mother and her siblings, and the father's family that they lived with refused to give them any money. So this very painful memory that she revealed to me one day, it sort of explains a lot of things about post-partition refugee culture, but why a lot of refugees that moved from across the border on either side were so particular about money. Uh, she told me that they never had enough money for the months. And so it was always her job to go to an aunt or an uncle or you know someone to ask for say five rupees. And for me now living in India, five rupees buys nothing. But for her at that time, five rupees was a huge amount. And so I remember sitting with her in her room and she had this money that her mother had carried and she was stacking up these Indian rupees, these one rupees. And she held five up to me and said, this is how much I asked for. And no one gave it to me. And it was, I mean, it just got such an incision in my heart. It, and even now, I feel it's, it's so heartbreaking. You know, I can feel goosebumps. Five rupees. Would have, she said it would have lasted them the month. Uh, anyway, um, people can... And, and do you think that, that memory was the impetus for your kind of, for your work? Well, it was a very important... It was very important, but it wasn't the beginning. The beginning was definitely the ghada and the guts. But I think by this time, when I learned about those coins, I had, I had read a lot about partition. I had accumulated a lot of information from people. I had understood how um, cultural, generational, um, complicated, how complicated partition memory is. So I think I had a better understanding for the coins, which is why I think it affects me so much, way more than the first objects, you know. Mm. <clears throat> So obviously people carried basic things like utensils uh, because even if they went to a camp or um, if they found themselves in a place where uh, they couldn't find any food, they may be able to borrow or get ration from somewhere and cook it in their utensils. Um, little things like, you know, boxes and anything. This is something that a person, this person who's holding it, he was a child. And so he remembers taking the box because his father used to put money for the temple in it, in Silawali. And it brings back, it brings back the time for him. Objects of cultural value. This is a khas dan in which pan is served to a khas mehman, a special guest. Uh, and when the woman to uh, whom this belongs to showed it to me in Pakistan, she did the whole, um, she offered the pan to me in the khas dan and I picked it up and I said adab and so it was a whole culture that was carried across. So apart from material things, um, intangible things, custom, heritage, language was also carried across. Punjabi Pulkari Bagh, again, items of cultural value. Notebooks and books. This is the notebook of a Punjabi nationalist poet and you can see it says uh, 1947, it says August 1947 um, and November 1947 as well. Certificates, people mm. took certificates because they thought it was, it was identification. They thought that they would get similar, if not the same job on the other side. In this case, the gentleman who's holding it, his father did end up getting a job in the railways in India as well. 
items of religious value a guru granth sahib read every day till date idols carried across locks and keys now this is something that's really heartbreaking that a lot of people thought and whether you've recorded so many stories where people have said the same thing that they just didn't believe that partition was going to happen yakeen hi nahi hone wala tha unko so they locked their homes because they were so sure they were going to come back and they carried the keys they carried the locks there is a story in my book where a woman is so sure that she's going to come back to her house that she locks the house 51 times with 51 keys and she carries a gucha um it is um the author gurcharan das his grandmother and he's telling me this and he says that as a child i remember this gucha of 51 keys it would jangle and whenever i would ask her she would say that it's the house we left behind mm. but she was so particular that not only did she lock the house 51 times but she also employed a cleaning woman to come and clean the house before they come back mm. as if they were going on you know vacation or something um so yeah old keys so many people have have these keys and they've held on to them with a sort of half broken promise of going back you know uh now this is an incredibly bizarre and of course very special thing someone carried this 15 and a half foot crocodile carcass across the border and this is the head displayed in all its glory um it has reduced shrunk considerably over the years and now it kind of looks like a ghadiyal but it's a crocodile head and the story is that there was a crocodile in bharwal village on the banks of the river bias and it used to eat dhobis washermen that used to come and wash the clothes and it had eaten three or four until this man took it upon himself to kind of kill this crocodile which he did and he put it on display and everyone in the village came and saw it and then when it was time for partition this was a prized object for him so he rolled up the skin he picked up the head and he carried it to lahore where it sits this way so proudly in his house but practically how how could how could he do that because you know you, you could you could carry so few things at the time so, i mean that would have been the first thing to to kind of leave on the way i mean this should also tell you something about class right if you are wealthy and you hear word of partition you're obviously going to pack things pack your family and go across the border to find accommodation right you're going to send things on the goods train which many people did so it should tell you about the different kinds of this is what this presentation should tell you different objects show you how much people knew about partition what their status was how much or how little they could take whether mm-hmm. they could go back so it tells you a lot about the social and cultural life of people and the hierarchy of society so he obviously was a wealthy man that could carry this crocodile carcass <laughs> but i mean like it's an incredible story <laughs> you know so weapons of course people carried weapons for protection and um i there you go this i want to i want to delve a little bit <clears throat> about this this sword uh and the story behind it because this story did something it i mean it changed something in me so i recorded this story in chandigarh a couple of years ago and um till then i hadn't hadn't touched kashmir and as you know kashmir is is something that's definitely a, it has continued on since partition so to understand the nature of what is happening in kashmir you have to understand its origin which is in partition and for the longest time it's a very vast terrain and it's a very um, tragic terrain but this sword took me inside and i think it just swallowed me up this sword belonged to a woman who was from an area called meerpur which is now on the pakistani side and in fact the area that she's from old meerpur is completely submerged under water and there are rumors that in the winter when the water of the mangla dam goes down the old city of meerpur comes up with its you know beautiful mm. gurdwaras and temples but in august 1947 nothing happened in meerpur because it was a princely state in november however the end of november 
And this is how she recalls it. So I will tell it as she recalls it. In November 1947, she was a teenager, I think 17 or 18, and she was nine months pregnant. She lived in Rawalpindi with her husband, but she had been visiting her family. So she was there in Mirpur with everyone. Her husband had received this sword from uh, the Chakwal Air Base, and he carried it with him uh, when he came with her. She remembers at the end of November, bullets raining from the sky. And subsequently, she and her husband went and hid in a basement in the village. Everybody was running everywhere. Her mother was abducted. Her grandmother and two siblings were abducted. Father, grandfather killed. The story is just horrendous. And I won't completely go into the details and stick to the details of the sword. So she is telling me that her husband is with her in this basement. There are bullets raining from the sky. They don't know who's attacking. They call them Kabailis. Now, who is the Kabaili? Are they mercenaries? Are they Pakistani army? Are they from Kabul? You don't know. So she called them Kabailis and I will call them Kabailis as well. Three days later, she remembers the bullets. Now, for three days, they are in the basement. Bullets have stopped raining. They get out of the basement and start running towards India. No one knows the direction to India, but they're running. They're running through the forest. She's nine months pregnant. The only thing they have is this sword. She and her husband are running with the whole village to what they hope is India. Meanwhile, she starts getting contractions and she gives birth to this baby girl in the forest. And the only thing they have to cut the umbilical cord with is this sword. And they do it. And her husband takes the baby and puts it aside and says, okay, we have to go. We, I can't carry the sword, carry you, carry the baby and find our way to India as well. They start running and five, barely five seconds later, this child starts crying. And the husband takes off his turban, he swaths the baby in it, and they move along to India. Now, fast forward, me going to see her a couple of years ago, 70 years have passed after partition. She is telling this story for the first time in all its gory intricacies in front of her family and in front of me, of course, but she's saying this for the first time. And the fact that she still has this sword, when I ask her what she feels, because it's the sword that cut her umbilical cord, it's the sword that saved her. When I ask her how she feels, she's completely, she couldn't care less about it because she, she says, I kept telling my husband to throw it every time he cleaned the house. But he kept saying, it's from our home. It's from where I'm from, it's from my land. And for her, it was the reminder of a very painful and traumatic night. And I think it continues to be. So this is a, this is a great example of how objects can carry trauma. Mm -hmm. And even if the trauma is not active, it is as much poignant and painful as when it was first generated. This is a photograph of her and her husband. And when she showed me this photograph, she made it very clear to tell me to hear stories about partition and to live the story of partition are two very different things. And uh, I don't think any of us will ever be able to feel that kind of loss or pain, but what we can try and do is empathize and report. Um, it also seems weird to go from one such an intense story to this. Uh, yeah, there are also, I recorded these incredible trunks that belong to the Geological Survey of India. Uh, VP Sondi, who was uh, the director of the Geological Survey, just during the war, in fact, Second World War, uh, his daughter, that's him, his daughter had his trunk and all the beautiful kind of inlay work and everything inside it. Um, and then, yes, I have two examples of things that were carried across. Uh, many years later, this pocket watch, which I, th I think is so charming, um, was carried from Kotli, which is also now in Pakistan, to Jammu. And in fact, this old man who's holding it, he's in his 80s. His teacher from first grade gave it to him when he went back to Kotli 60 years after partition. Uh, so 60 years later, his first grade teacher took off his pocket watch and gave it to his student because he had come back to Kotli after so long. 
and then this old houses particularly in punjab used to have these name plates outside and they had like stories and names of family members and this is um i'll use my cursor here this is where the plaque used to be so the story goes that mia fez rawani left jalandhar in 47 but he really longed to go home it was very difficult for him to get out of jalandhar but he really longed to go home so 25 years after partition he found a way to go back and he loved it because he went back to his house and he saw everything was perfect and you know the house was called shams manzil shams manzil the plaque still stood it was so proud and he, he loved that it was still there the sikh gentleman who lived in his house said my mail still comes on shams manzil so it is a matter of pride so fez rawani went home a very happy man fast forward 25 years his niece travels with her husband to jalandhar from lahore and she wants to go see the house and they find that the house is being broken and turned into an apartment complex and they request the owners whether they can take this plaque back home to her uncle and they ended up giving it to him for his birthday as a present hmm. um so I, you know and when he received it i remember he said that for years i used to think that jalandhar was on the other side and i longed to be near it but when he received this plaque he felt like jalandhar was home and it was here it was in his hands mm. so this is the power of objects they they return something to us you know don't let their intangible nature fool you because they are very powerful mechanisms for memory um and i think these are yeah this is the end of my <laughs> slide show um this is just the interviewing process so i will stop right there so um when i um when i was interviewing people and they not all of them had objects but remember mahendra dal and his brick and he took he went back and he took the brick from his home and it sat in edinburgh on his table in the middle of the living room in a in a glass kind of cabinet so that everyone could see it and he could tell everyone i'm originally from pakistan and i moved over and i just wondered with all the objects that you talked about were they displayed for everyone to see or were they kept away or were they hard to find how did people relate to them today all kinds all kinds i think it's difficult to generalize anything with partition is difficult to generalize so but what i noticed was that if the object was obviously valuable and by that i mean monetarily valuable so say um jewelry or gold you know or silver people carried it out and they took it out and they showed it to me and they knew where it was and they wore it but say the object was you know like a book or a photo album or even a pen then it was very mundane or a shawl these are the things that i remember people having to search because they didn't think the object was important enough for a scholar to come to their house mm-hmm. and talk about it for so long Now the other interesting thing is that if someone was connected at all to anyone in politics at the time and by this i mean even if they had a newspaper cutting of say jinnah or mount bat no gandhi they would always bring it out and they would always say that why do you want to interview us you know our stories are not so interesting we are not nehru or jinnah we are not patel we are not as if as if legitimizing what they had to say exactly. exactly but this is the thing this is a really sad thing that people who live through partition do not think that the stories are important enough and the reason is that because they had to normalize it so quickly they lived in camps they had to earn for their families they had to feed they couldn't think about it they didn't have the luxury of time they didn't dwell on what they felt so they normalized it and they didn't think also because everyone around them was going through the same thing it was such a collective traumatic experience that they didn't think that their individual experience was important enough Did you get the sense then that when you interview them because I definitely found that interviewing people here but maybe it's different in India that because they normalized it or they had to get on with their lives they hadn't really thought about it very much or if they had it had gone around their head but they certainly hadn't said the words out loud or even out loud to family members so told the whole story
you, you cut off a little bit in the middle. Sorry. Um, I, I, I just wondered, did you find if, feel that they were saying the words out loud for the first time when first they told time? Absolutely. Or, or, you know, parts of the story for the first yeah. time. So family members, and actually this was very rare that members of the family sat with us when we interviewed, mm. uh, when, when I interviewed them. It was usually just me and them. Um, and I also had a rule for myself that I wouldn't go back another time because then people knew what I wanted to hear and how I wanted to hear it. So, I mean, these are just some, some rules I made for myself. But that, that's a rule we differ on. No, and that's totally fine because the purpose of our project was totally different, yeah. right? Um, and I mean, the thing was, I wish that sometimes I had a team, but uh, it was just me. Anyway, I thought that people that, say, for example, if I was interviewing a professor, and this has happened, this is a story that is in my book, uh, Professor Partha Mitra, he had, he had thought so much about what he had gone through and how he felt and what his family had gone through. He had really considered every arc of the story that when he was telling it also, it was very much like a story. You know, I mean, the details were there, the nuances were there and that is really good. But the other side is that sometimes when people are saying it for the first time, mm. there is so much uncharted territory there. Mm. And the words, just, they, they just weigh differently, you know, and especially if they're saying it in Hindi or Punjabi or Urdu or Samani Shai, Bangla, it just, I, I, I can't explain it. I can hear the voice and I know you hear it too. I know that you hear how people said things. I know that you remember because it's, it is such a precious conversation you're having, right? Mm -hmm. I felt like a lot of things were said for the first time, much mm -hmm. to the surprise of the family members, mm -hmm. definitely. And that's what's interesting, isn't it? That sometimes you're dealing in the room with different emotions. So it's the person who you feel you owe a duty of care to. But then it's very emotional for other family members who might be of a different generation to absorb what they are hearing for the very first time. And actually you then, as you walk out the door, realise other, other conversations are then going to take place after yeah, you've gone. Definitely. I think for me, the because I, I have one of those projects that's rare that it goes across India and Pakistan because of visa restrictions, a lot of books and projects just can't. Mm. So I think I got both sides and the interesting thing, and maybe you felt this too, because you have such a diverse range of interviewees in your book that there is no shared history of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Britain. The four places that it, it affected don't share a common history because it meant different things for different people. Um, but of course, I think that the more you interview, these nuances come through in the way people talk about partition as well, right? Mm. Um, I, I found um, that, um, so for example, different generations um, mm -hmm. would fight over the one object that had <laughs> remained like a tile or mm. you know, stones. And that those little tiny fragments were literally the only thing that they had to show I lived in that land too. And, and those had almost been elevated to ancestral homes. Is that what you found too? That, that actually a small object was all people had to prove that they lived on the other side of the border. And so they had a huge significance, not only for that generation that you spoke to, but also for subsequent generations. I think it depends um, for the generation that lived through it and owned the object. Yes, the status of the object has been augmented to, to heirloom and, and beyond, definitely. And it was, you know, it was, it was not just the way you talk, but it was also the reverential nature in which they carry the object. Mm -hmm. You know, like a photograph is not just handed to you, the photograph is handed to you. And, and they're careful about how you touch it. But this also depends on what part of our conversation the object was retrieved in. Uh, and if the object was mundane, and if the object was special, it all depends on these factors. But with subsequent generations, I have always, I mean, I've seen in my own family that the second generation, which is my parents, didn't ask so many questions, mm -hmm. which of course is different than you, than you because your father also lived through partition. Uh, but the impetus to do something came from you, which is the second generation. But I think in India and Pakistan, because we live in an area that is so fraught with geopolitical conflict, 
there is such a burning question about where you came from. People, particularly the third generation, the millennial, is so interested in the other side because we just don't have access to it. We don't have access to it. So anything that connects us, whether it is an object, a YouTube video, an Instagram profile, um, anything. But well, why is it the third generation? Because it's really interesting you say that, and we've talked about this, that when I was looking for interviewees, it was the third generation who would come and say, I think maybe my grandparents have a story. Mm -hmm. but why, why particularly in India and Pakistan, why that thirst? Because I would assume that perhaps they'd known about it, learned about it in school, for example. Well, we do learn about it, but um, it's very like reductive. It's not a nuanced study by any means. I think, to be honest, I learned more about European history, the American Civil War, than I did about the Indian independence movement, which is a huge shame. But I think that there are a number of things. One, we are a generation that has access to the internet, so we can see, right? We also have access to the media, which means that we may get a certain, certain version of events. The other thing, and I think that this is really key, something happened in 2017 with the 70th anniversary of partition. I don't know if you feel this, mm. but something big happened, which, which didn't happen on other anniversaries. Maybe it was the fact that people were now, this generation was, was going to the kind of end stages of their life. Maybe it was the fact that there is more generational conversation. I don't know, but something mm. happened and something big happened that made people start recording stories and start reaching out to scholars like you and me. I know that it did because that's where the bulk of my interviews came from. It's from people saying, oh, we may have this. And mind you, I wasn't just looking for stories. I was looking for objects. Yeah. So it was very, very hard. You know, everything from a library card to a, to a jar full of pickles in which gold jewelry was carried across because you know, oil doesn't corrode gold and all these nuskes that women had thought of at the time. I, I had everything, but it usually always came from people my age. But do you not find it hopeful that that third generation perhaps transcends very hardened national narratives and actually understand that, that, that there's something more nuanced that, that happened? Because the partition generation, when they tell you their stories, it is very nuanced. It's not what you hear from, you know, Indian or, or Pakistani political leaders. And so that, to me, that's hopeful. Is that how you saw it? I mean, I live here. <laughs> so I know that, uh, I know it takes all kinds, but it makes me very happy that there are people that are willing to see past media because you know that not everything the media shows you is accurate. And as someone who's been to the other side, if I have the access to go there and show people the truth, then I have the responsibility to do that, right? If I have the ability to dispel certain myths, then I have the responsibility to do that. There's, there's, there's no question. But I think that, yes, I'm hopeful that people my age are trying. They are curious. And when there is curiosity, there will always be some thirst for something. Right? I know what I want to see in my lifetime is, and it's, it just seems so ridiculous because I don't know if it'll ever happen, is for visa restrictions to be a little less stringent. For mm. people to go and see where they were from, for divided families to visit on weddings and funerals, you know, basic things like that. Mm. I think that that's maybe one of the first steps to some sort of healing between these countries. I'm I'm really curious because here when people say where are you from it's very a loaded question but when you ask your interviewees or that generation where are they from do they always give you the really long answer do they always say oh well I was born in you know Lahore and then I came over or do they just give you the short answer and the same for the third generation do they do they want to give you the longer answer tell me uh, for people that migrated across, they will always, almost always, tell you the village or the city. Uh, I've, noticed, um, I've noticed different things in India and Pakistan. In Pakistan, if you ask someone where you're from, they will say India. 
but in india if you ask someone where they're from because pakistan wasn't created until august 47 they may just say di khan or they may say banu or they may say lahore they will almost never say the word pakistan right and then they will always say uske baad hum yahan aa gaye like we came after i don't know if the word partition is really uttered that much in the conversation partition batwara taqseem vibharjan it's I don't, I don't remember them using these mm. words. Um, now for the third generation, it's funny because my whole life I've said I'm from Delhi. And now after studying and being a scholar of partition for so long, I have picked this, the one of the cities where one of my grandparents came from. And I have said I'm from there as well. Mm-hmm. You know, my grandparents came from as far as D.I. Khan to Malakwal and Lahore. And now I tell people that I am as much Delhiite as I am Lahori. Because when I was in Lahore, which is several times and for long durations, I felt Lahori. It was a city that welcomed me. And so, of course, I'm, I'm from there. And I think that this, you have to be a certain kind of person to record these things. Like, you know that as much as I do. You have to be a certain, you have to be open you have to be a sponge, but you also don't have to be, you have to stop the wave at a certain point. And I think with these, there's, there's so many conversations that I think the only way that I could, I could do justice to it is to see myself as being from both sides, mm. trying to understand both sides. You know, I remember when, when I was in college, I used to have a friend that as a joke, he called me Pakistani. And this is when I was 17, 18, 18, I think. And it really used to get to me. It really used to get to me. And I think even now, the Indian media does this. You know, if you have connections to the other side, if you, if you speak warmly of someone from the other side, uh, if you speak humanly, really, um, they tell you, they call you Pakistan, they tell you to go back to Pakistan. Not all, but of course, mm-hmm. there will always be these kinds of people. But now I think that, yeah, that's fine. That, that's the land where my grandparents are from. And I, I feel like I'm a part of that place. I've given a lot of myself to that place. And I mean, how was a book like yours received in India and Pakistan? Is it just, let's say, the liberals who just think, yes, there, there is another way? Or has it, has it made people think about these very hardened national narratives? Well, let's say if you think that the book about objects is only a book about objects, then it's an easy read and it's an easy thing to swallow as well. But once you go beyond the object and look at things like class and culture and gender and gender roles and identity and all sorts of pain, I think that the book means different things to different people Mm -hmm. based on their nationality. You know, um, it is well received. It continues to be very well received in India and Pakistan and Britain. Um, It speaks to certain very key human values. It speaks to things that everyone can feel. So I think that there will always be space for conversation. But it depends on how you perceive the book. Do you perceive it as a material study or are you willing to go beyond the object to see really what it stands for? You know, um, uh, I just wondered. I mean, you were very young when you started mm. your uh, research. You were twenty-three, and these are very, very heavy memories to listen to, to absorb, um, and it takes its toll on you. How did you, you know, how did you? cope with I mean of course you you, you say to you you mentioned one of your interviewees to hear it and live it are two very different things and you didn't live it it wasn't you you know it's not your trauma but to listen day in day out to these memories it does something to you and I'm and I know it does has done to other uh, scholars of partition how did you deal with that I think that for many years um because you're doing it routinely and because it's, it's quote unquote like a job for you, right? To go and interview people and record these is your job. 
I didn't think of it as any, I didn't think anything was happening. But then it was Ajit Kaur's interview with the sword. And now I've just, you know, in this, in this talk, I've just brushed over her, her story very quickly, but it was harrowing. It was harrowing to the extent that I traveled all the way from Delhi to Chandigarh. On the way back, I couldn't stop thinking about it. The night I couldn't stop thinking about it. The night after I couldn't stop thinking about it. And it was not just the details that she told me that were harrowing. The fact that family had been abducted, family had been killed. They had been taken to a concentration camp. It was not just the details. It was how she told the story. Mm. It was as if she was reading it in a newspaper. And it wasn't hers. And she was just like reading it to me, this happened, that happened. It was so disjointed from her person that I, I mean, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And it really broke me. It really broke me to an extent that I don't think I've seriously done interviews since, you know, seriously with a serious project in mind because it was so harrowing. And, and you, you see that pain is still, a real thing like the pain and the wound from partition is so deep mm. it's so so deep mm. that 70 years on we are still bearing its burden in in very unforeseen ways you know not just like in terms of the geography or politics but very quiet intimate um, kind of like glass cutting a body in half way you know i mean i can't describe it but the way in which she was really telling her story was like like just reading it like she, she was just like looking at herself going through these things you know like a ghost or something i think that i didn't think about what it was doing to me until then and after that it was really heavy and it does something to to you to the people you interact with it i have a bodily reaction after i talk about partition and i know i'm gonna have it after this as well um my head aches and my body goes very cold so I was curious about what it did to other people. And I started, in a way, interviewing other oral historians of partition to find out what they went through and how they cope. And I, I, I mean, it was everything from seeking therapy to shutting myself in a room. And I remember uh, in January, Kavita, you said that you sort of dreaded talking about the book. Yeah. I understand. I understand because you spent, you know, it's, it's so intimate. These conversations are so intimate. Mm. They're more intimate than, than conversations with family because these people are your family. You know, they've made, you made them your family by, by entering into this invisible contract. Mm. But they're so precious and intimate and they are giving you these vulnerable parts of your life to hold on, to, to take care of. It's a huge responsibility and I think that because I was so young, I just had to grow so quickly. Mm. There was no choice. There was absolutely no choice. It's funny because you posted an Instagram the other day of one of your interviewees dying. And I knew exactly what you were going through because it's exactly that intimacy that you talk about. There's nothing, it's funny, you can you have conversations with your interviewees that you don't have with the closest people to you in your life and when they die it's like well firstly you dread that email from their relative but it's it's like a dear family member has died and i i knew exactly what that that would have meant for you because you may have been the only person who heard that story and stirred stirred those memories that otherwise they could have quite possibly carried with them till the day they died um, his son, I know, is, is listening. Oh, okay. I know this is what he said as well, but really, um, I want to add here that it's a, this conversation between people, it's collaborative. You know, you're not the only person recording the story. They're willing to give you their story. They're, they're willing to tell, which means that you have spent ample amount of time making them trust you. Mm. There is, this is a, this is a, relationship of trust there's nothing that can come without it and just finally because i know there are so many questions i want to ask you um you know the stories that you heard uh, and you heard them at a very young age must have shaped you 
probably permanently. How, how has it changed you, do you think? I think that one of the greatest things it did was to show me that we are all born with bias and prejudice, just because we are born in a certain country, under a certain religion, in a certain class. There are things that are intrinsic. And this work has shown me that I need to shed some of that. And I have shed a lot of it. It's very hard. It's, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's like a daily exercise on yourself, right? Um, to shed your notions of who you think the other may be, to shed religious and communal bias, to listen is, I can't stress this enough. It's so important for millennials to start to listen to people. Um, but I think really that the shedding, it was so important, particularly when I went, when I went to Pakistan, a lot of things that I took absolutely for granted faced me. You know, there was a place that I was the other. And how, how did that feel? And are we always the other? How do we create the other? So I think the largest thing has been to, to listen to people, to listen to various experiences, to not judge. We cannot judge history either. We are not, we historians are not there to judge it or vilify it or justify it. We are there to present the versions. That's it. Thank you, Anshul. Um, I'm just going to pick out a couple of um, okay. questions. And I think Amandeep might have to take over because I, I have to that. Yeah, but um, someone, Mohammed has asked, as an art historian and author, can you please reflect on the importance of oral history in documenting stories around material memories? And I think it's something that, you know, you're asked a lot, I know, also. And I think it's worth kind of maybe talking about is, why oral history is important and, and, and how reliable it is. Hmm. Um, I know academic and traditional historians may look down on oral history, calling it history from beneath. Um, but I think in, in countries like India and Pakistan, where there is such a rich culture of oral tradition and storytelling in such a sparse culture of academic archival information, Oral history can really come in handy. The other thing I think is that with partition, because it was a version of events and the academic versions are contingent on who is writing and who won, right? So the fact that I an Indian had to go to London to sit in the British archives to study what actually happened should show you that it is not um, a cohesive, holistic history. Oral history will give you the voices it will give you the lived archive i think it is important because as i think as cultures get older this tradition gets stronger with people so we grow up listening to stories i grew up listening i know we all did here right so i think that if people say memory is unreliable and it is not an authentic source I disagree with that because as an event, with an event as vast as this, with versions as many as we have, I think memory is one of the most authentic ways in which we can take our readers back to that time. Um, when I was doing my interviews, I didn't just ask about partition. I also asked all sorts of things that my interviews thought were really funny, like how did you wear your hair at the time? Or did you wear a dress? Or did you wear a salwar kameez? Or, what kind of transportation did your family have, if you had any? And I think these are the things you may never learn in textbooks or archival sources. I think the alternate histories will tell you a lot more. So in fact, my secondary sources, a lot of my secondary sources were also self-published books that people had written about partition, you know, that told you the very nuanced thing, like the bricks in my house were made of this length and this color, and they were called so-and-so that you'll never find anywhere. So I, I am an oral historian. This is the reason I use the term oral historian versus historian, because I believe in the lived archive. Thank you. Um, a very good question from Jassa Alualia. Uh, um, partition of, of Bengal is largely lost amidst the focus of Punjab. Um, maybe talk about some of your objects if they came from Bengal and do you think actually more focus needs to be 
on the partition of Bengal in 1947? I would say that both Punjab and Bengal are too focused on. We don't know enough about Chittagong, we don't know enough about Assam, we still don't know enough about Kashmir, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, United Provinces. So I think that the fact that even 70 years later, so much still remains to be understood and learned can show us the nature of memory that exists from that time. Um, yes, I did do research in Bengal. I did incredible research in Bengal. One of the very interesting things about doing research in a language you don't understand <laughs> is that you also understand the elasticity of that language. So I remember this interview that I was doing in uh, Kolkata where the family members would speak amongst themselves for a good five minutes in Bangla and then the daughter would translate and it would just literally be a line. And I was just so interested in the fact that, you know, here we are talking about memory, we're talking about remembrance. The man I was interviewing had had three brain hemorrhages, so he would already forget a lot of things, which meant that his wife over the years had started noting down everything he had said about his time in um, Barisal, which is now in Bangladesh. Uh, so she became the memory keeper in a way. And what he had, incidentally, was a refugee certificate an identification certificate of when he first entered India. Um, there are also many other things. I, I recorded a lot of books on the Bengali side, obviously. Uh, the trunk that I showed in the presentation is also from Calcutta. Thank you, Anshul. Um, I have to head off sadly, but I've loved talking to you as ever. Thank you. And Amandeep um, so is going to take over now with questions. Perfect. I can do that. Kavita, thank you very much indeed for, uh, for leading us through that. that was, I really appreciate that. And thank you very much, of course, uh, Anjul as well. So, Kavita, thank you. Okay. Uh, gosh, look what have we got. We've got well over 200 people um, <laughs> online. But lots and lots of questions. Uh, I'm, I, I've noted a few of the really interesting ones uh, that you didn't, that you didn't, address mm. during your talk because some of them you've, you've actually addressed so they, they've become less relevant but can I also ask simultaneously just ask people anyone that wants to ask a question sort of live as it were just put your hand up and then I will call out I'll call out a name or two um, right there was one there's one question that I really liked because uh, it just gives you the, the opportunity to talk about something perhaps you've not published was there an object this came from a nuke of the Sanj, was there an object or a story that you didn't have space for within the book, but you'd like, like to explore? You didn't quite get to the bottom of it. Well, um, there are several stories that uh, are not in the book. And also the research is still continuing. So I am still recording uh, stories of objects. But were there stories? Yeah, I mean, I recently, and there are stories that I have uh, found now after the book has been published yeah. for example someone came up to me with this beautiful driving license from east pakistan recently and it is just spectacular i mean the, the document in itself is a work of art you know amdeep i know you would appreciate it being <laughs> such a connoisseur of the art object but i thought my god i wish i wish i had put that in you know and then i have to say that in india the book came out in 2017 um and then an updated um, version came out in 2018. And in 2018, I actually added two chapters into the book that in 2017, I had said, oh, I wish I'd put them inside. So is, there anything, is there any difference between your UK edition and the Indian edition? Because those, those two oh, jacket okay. covers are very striking. So I will show you these. Right. If you have the Indian paperback, then the UK one is exactly the same. Right. It's okay. The most updated. I know this is the thing with like two different covers, two different titles, yes. <laughs> and various editions. Um, but I thought that in 2018, I wanted to add those two chapters because one, I hadn't touched Kashmir yet. And Ajit Kaur's story was the one I added about Kashmir, which I thought was very important and needed to be heard. It was an, a, woman's, a woman's story that, you know, I mean, people shy away from Kashmir and partition because it leads you into the geopolitics of the area now. But hers was just such an important story that I had to add it. And the other story I added was about the trunk. 
from the geological survey because that was just fascinating and the travel that he had done during partition was fascinating as well so answering your question yes i'm continually tempted to want to add more things yeah, you become a sort of a magnet for people's it's great people sort of narratives on uh, yeah. that so look, on the, you just flashed up your the, the jacket cover the i think it's the indian edition has has that beautiful um picture of your grandmother wearing that sticker so we did have a question from actually a, vol a volunteer who's helping us uh, out on the book club shamni shirkil but not because it's her because i think it's a good question mm -hmm. why, why don't you just talk a little bit about that particular story because that must have been the origin story for for you in many respects so you must have grown up around i wish it was but it wasn't <laughs> i wish it was um i think this is so and this speaks to a lot of partition families here in india that, that until you don't ask you mm -hmm. may not be told right so this the first story that really got me was the ghada and the girls and that was my mother's family um but but this mamtika um is from my father's family and her my grandmother's mother was a single mother and she came to india on august 14 i think with her children and because she was single you know she had no man with her she came she didn't have anything she stayed with a relative that ultimately thought they were a burden because she had come with so many children so on august 16 she stood on Old Delhi Railway, plat uh, the platform of Old Delhi Railway Station, wanting to go back to the Northwest Frontier Province, which was now in Pakistan. My grandmother remembers seeing these, this like little mountain of corpses, and she still remembers the blood, and she was 16. So, I mean, it's, if, if you take her deep into that memory, she will recall it with great detail, because it's so visceral still. And her mother, didn't get a lot of money or anything because she didn't have it but she did carry this piece of jewelry and it goes back to what i was saying about people carrying jewelry or wealth to use as mortgage or collateral so she thought that she would mortgage this get some money um help the children to study or or you know worst comes to worst sell it so she didn't end up selling it thankfully she gave it to my grandmother on her wedding and when I told my grandmother to put this on, we were just kind of having a fun photo shoot with it. When I told her to put it on, my grandmother told me it was the second time in her life that she had put it on. Oh. One was at her wedding and the other was that day. And she put it on and it was so striking. And I knew in that moment that was going to be the cover of the book. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, there was no other contender for it because it was so striking. It was such a beautiful piece of jewelry on an otherwise gray head. It is the eyes. I urge you all to look at the, I'm going to do something here. Um, Don't look I'm, at the picture, buy the book. Get the I'm, Indian edition if you can. <laughs> yes, I'm actually, I'm going to share the screen here of, of the books so you can see them, oh, the two lovely. covers. Um, you know, just the, look at the eyes. They're so, they're happy, they're naughty. <laughs> I love the wrinkles. I love the gray hair. She hates the wrinkles. But I thought that it was so reflective of the idea and the book. It encompassed everything in it. And what's the jacket photograph on the, on the UK edition? That is Jasminder Gulati's mother. And I hope that he is listening uh, right now. Th those are Nale or Nade. I, I, am a, I am an Urdu speaker. I'll say Nade. I know Punjabi will say Nale. Correct. It's like the drawstrings of the pajamas, the shalwars. Um, they were handmade by her family, her, his mother's family in Multan. And you can see the, the very intricate weave uh, of the cloth and the very, the braids at the ends. And they were carried from Multan to Delhi. And what is really special about this cover is when I was taking the photograph, she was singing a song about Parandis and Nalas. And it was just beautiful because she was like arranging them and singing the song and I have her. I have her voice in my head right now. This is how visceral, you know, interviews are. Um, but both my covers, they have, they have stories. Until you should uh, publish a book of photography, because that's another route in. I mean, I mean, the photographs you've taken are wonderful, still lifes. They're artistic, and then they're just, they're just loaded with narrative as well. Mm -hmm. 
But you know, I think that's, that's because of the time one spends with your subject. I doubt that they would be so full of stories if we hadn't spent so much time mm -hmm. together. I always take the photograph after the interview because right. we are familiar. Um, they are not so hesitant with a camera or a phone. You know, so it, it's all about, as I was saying earlier, it's all about the trust that you develop with people. So, so let's move to some participants now. I just did notice that Jasmine de Gulati has actually put his hand up. So I think I'm, I'm going to take you off mute. If you take yourself off mute, Jasmine de, you'll be able to speak and ask your question. So, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm audible, but... Uh, you are. You know, I, I, I owe an eternal debt to Anchal. And uh, she knows I'm very fond of her, so that's a separate matter. But, uh, you know, uh, I... Uh, you know, uh, it's a surreal how uh, how uh, probably a like on an Instagram led Anchal to coming home, and I had to lure her. By the way, I had to tell her that my my dad makes this lovely mutton curry at home, and would she like some? And uh, and you know, I I got her for that, and you know, and she came over, and I I suspect it's the it's the mutton curry, uh, but you know. It's uh, and then you know, this is it's going to lead up to a, a very morbid question in a second. But uh, you know the fact that she came over and you know uh, certainly did a favor, huge favor to me and my family by documenting my father. And funnily, the whole discussion was with my father, but my mother is on the hands are on the cover. And then you know, Anshul resonated to my mother's story. Though of course she did document my father's story. Uh, the morbidity is that my father, I lost my father to COVID and Anshul knows that about a month back, I lost my dad and it, it was dire. Uh, she knows it. Uh, she wasn't, you know, the, one of the few people I was able to share my life the day my father passed away in a hospital in Delhi. And, uh, you know, it was just sad that we couldn't get his body as well. But, you know, I got my whole family in the US and Anshul on, on, on a video call. And that's the, that's the point I'm making here. Anjal's a, you know, a family member now. She's a part of, you know, she's met me, what, 20 minutes of my life? Don't cry, Anjal, please. I, 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 uh, you know, 20 minutes of my life. And, and this is, you know, in many ways I've been thinking, you know, my, my nani used to say this, and I'll repeat, and she's, Anjal said that. She used to say, I was born in the house, I said, so the point I'm just making, you know, my father left like that. He left the home and never came back. And I said, oh my God, the guy left his son with a real life example on what it felt like to go out of a house and never come back. This one being slightly more morbid, but uh, so Anshul, I just have to thank you. I raise my hand just to thank you publicly. Okay. Sorry, Amar, this is not a question. Really, you don't have to thank me. Honestly, the pleasure is mine. Um, I should tell you that, uh, I should tell everyone, in fact, earlier when Kavitha mentioned that Instagram post about one of my interviews who had died, it was Jasminder's father. And the greatest thing I learned from him is that all the things you carry from your home, you know, objects, everything aside, are the intangibles. He carried language. He carried this photographic memory. I sat with the man for two hours, maybe. He made the most detailed map of Silla Valley that I can, I can fathom. I don't think I can make a map this detailed of the home I live in right now. 70 years ago, he lived in a place, and now he remembers every nook, cranny. This is... This is how visceral partition memory is. And uh, just when I need to thank people like you and your family for allowing me to be a, be a part of your story. It's, it's really you know, a collaborative effort. I don't want to hawk time, but Amadeep, I need to say this. Somebody from Silamwali reached out on Instagram hardly 48 hours back to me and she stays opposite the railway station. And she's telling me, tell me where you want to go. And I said, walk on those gullies and do a prayer because my father would have loved to be on that gully. So this is a, as, as uh, real as it gets. Yeah. As Minda, thank, thank you. you so, so much for that. That was really very moving. I'm so deeply sorry for your loss um, earlier this month. That must be a very difficult thing to have to go through. 
uh, right now. But thank you very much for contributing. Um, let's move on. How do you follow that? Dimple Motwani, do you, would you like to ask a question? Yes, please. Um, sorry, I just have to scroll all the way up. Um, on a personal level, how did you feel interviewing these amazing people and then uh, taking on the responsibility of doing justice to their stories, considering that there are so many intimate moments that hold a lot of weight to all of them? Well, I think when I was in the interview process, my focus is always on the conversation at hand. So it's, it's funny as it may sound, I don't actually concentrate on processing the details, right? I'll give you an example. Imagine that you're going to the British Library and you have one day and all you can do is photograph all the documents you want to study. And then yeah. you come home and you go through them. The thing was, when I listened, when I was transcribing or when I was translating or when I was listening to the voices, it really dawned on me what I had heard. Because in that moment, what you're trying to do is get the person to open up and talk as much as they can about that time. Now, on the notion of responsibility, this is something that everyone takes up personally. I know that I am responsible to put forth the story as it was told to me, even if it is not the version that I ascribe to or I agree with. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So for instance, when I was in Pakistan, a lot of things that were told to me were things that I had not, and this is the first time, so I was a lot younger also, so they were not things that I had read in history or understood to be my history. But even then, I put it in the book as I'd heard it because that is how people lived it. And this really, it comes back to the versions of partition. I have a responsibility to do justice to people's stories, but maybe not everyone does, right? Um, you have to take that into consideration, um, the ethics of the interview, you know? Right. Um, I just want to really thank you for um, writing this book. I, I had um, picked it up when I was in Bombay last year. And then after I finished it, I was telling my boyfriend about how much it moved me. And um, for our anniversary, he actually got me an autographed copy. I, I don't know if you remember this, but he... Did you write uh, to me on Instagram? Yes, that's the one. <laughs> Oh, well, that's so sweet. Thank you to yeah. him. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anshul. Thank you, Dibble. Thank you, Anshul. Let's Thank keep moving on because we're getting some great contributions online. Um, I'm going to skip over Suppen, who's asked a question before, and I tried to get new voices, so I might come back to you later. But Steve Dariwell, why don't you go up next? Oh suddenly got very shy and has hung up. So I'm going to go over to, um, I am going to go to Sutton now. Okay. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, hi, Anshul. Um, your, your talk was absolutely beautiful. And I, I have a question about something that I don't think you touched upon. Maybe I was late, but um, in the Partition Museum in Amritsar, there's a section about um, the objects museums and how they were distributed across the border following the partition. And I was wondering whether in your research you... Stephen, um, the objects of what? Uh, sorry, uh, maybe the internet cut off. The objects um, contained within museums. Okay. And I was wondering whether um, you had any thoughts to offer on how those objects were distributed between the museums across both sides of the border. I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating um, specifically on the Punjab border, but maybe also the Bengal border might, uh, might be relevant. Uh, and when they were distributed, were there any agreements in place as to whether they would be on loan to, um, whether a particular object might be on loan for a particular museum and then return to another one later? And have those agreements endured? And are there any are there any um, instances of objects being stolen from particular museum uh, collections? Because in in contemporary in contemporary uh, thought, we we often talk about, um, for example, Nadir Shah taking the the um, the peacock throne from Delhi in the 18th century. Right? 
are there any famous examples of objects being stolen in the partition by either side? So um, you're asking about objects of public nature. Um, I don't, I, museums in India and Pakistan, I should preface by saying, don't really work in the same way or in as organized a fashion as they may in the West yet. Um, that being said, I know that when partition happened, and, and I should also say that um, my, my expertise is really personal objects carried by people, not uh, public objects that were divided between states, but still, um, what I know I will share. I know that when partition happened, there were all sorts of bizarre things that were divided in Viceroy House. Everything from chairs to cutlery, we've seen the infamous photograph of B.S. Casewin, who is the national librarian dividing the library, which is actually a staged photograph. But uh, even so, um, the library attempted to get divided between uh, India and Pakistan. And then when they couldn't, most of those books were actually sent to Bengal. Uh, but everything was divided, including a new... Um, a new shipment of ducks that had arrived from Britain. And actually, there is a great podcast uh, done by the BBC by um, Kanish Tharoor in 2017, um, which talks exactly about divided objects of public nature. In terms of the specificities of the artifacts with museums, I know for a fact that objects of the Indus Valley civilization were divided between India and Pakistan. Uh, maybe the most famous example is a necklace that had seven stones and three were given to Pakistan and four were given to India, I think. Uh, but it is only divided as per the geographic ratio of the country. So even in terms of like other artifacts, they were divided as to one is to three or something like that. Um, that being said, if you go to the Lahore Museum today, they have one of the largest collections of Buddhist stupas in the world, right? Which is really interesting. Um, I'm sure there are more studies on that, but uh, I, I don't know if it's. Still, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, uh, I when I was in Pakistan last year, I, I, I managed to visit the the Buddhist stupas in um, Taxila, mm -hmm. and that was remarkable because I had I had Definitely. no idea that 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 non-Islamic um, or pre-Islamic um, artifacts had been preserved in Pakistani museums. It was a wonder to see. Right. Um, I don't know. I wish I knew more about how they were divided at the time. This podcast that I mentioned is a great way to start. But again, um, answering your question about how objects are on loan between museums in India and Pakistan, I don't think that's ever happened, personally. Okay, let's let's keep moving. Let's keep moving on. Lots of questions. Uh, let me just take one now. This one again might not be one that you've you've come across actually. So this is about people that have not not leaving objects behind, actually leaving their religion behind. Did you come across instances, stories of people that stayed but converted uh, or forced to convert, presumably? Um. So I have yes. Yes, well, not forced to convert, but chose to convert. Okay. And also, so the, actually, there was an interesting interview I did in Lahore of a Hindu family who chose to stay and remain Hindu in Pakistan. That actually I didn't include in the book. Um, and maybe this is a good, good place to talk about it because uh, I feel very differently now about the interview than I did when I recorded it. So I was in Lahore, someone gave me this contact of someone who had been very young at the time of partition, but his family chose to stay in Pakistan and they were Hindu. And um, I contacted him and very happily he said, Aap Indian, Aap Hindu, Hum Hindu, Milte hain. He was very, very pleased to meet me. But um, it was very interesting because all through the interview, and I, mind you, I was 24 years old at the time. I don't think I would have reacted the way I did then as I am now. Um, all through the interview, I got this feeling that he was lying to me. And because I think that if you read anything about minority culture in Pakistan and vis-a-vis -vis what he was telling me at the time, they just didn't fit. 
you know, according to him, life was very rosy, life was great, and uh, everything was wonderful. And I just didn't, like, I don't know why, I think because the rest of my interviews were going so well in Pakistan, I felt really cheated out of this interview. And I know it's, it's very silly, but I remember leaving that place and I remember sitting in the car and I had a lovely driver, though I really don't want to call him a driver. He was my man Friday. Um, Khizarji, he's looking at me. We're just crossing, you know, Minare, Pakistan. We are on the flyover. He's looking at me from the rear view mirror and, and I'm like so close to tears. And he asked me, what happened, Anjilji? Interview not good. And I just burst out crying. And then he, and he said something to me then, you know, and he was always doling out these massive Punjabi wisdoms to me, <laughs> this very plain type, you know. He said something to me, he said, ki jo hoti na, wo same nahi hoti hai. which meant that all five fingers of the hand are not the same, which meant that every interview will not be the same. And sure enough, that's all I needed to hear at that time. And I was fine. And he was right. But going back to the interview itself, I didn't include it in the book because I thought that I wasn't getting the truth. But what I didn't understand then, and I may understand now, is that there are certain things you cannot say publicly to protect yourself, mm -hmm. protect yourself from your government especially if you know they may be published somewhere. And I think I dismissed the interview too, too abruptly. And I think that there is more there. There is, a, there is a deeper study to be made for why things cannot be said and why he chose to say what he did. But at the time, I didn't think that way. And now I wish I could return and ask again. Do you have plans? Is, is it even possible to go back now because the world changes of the politics of, of, of that border change frequently. Um, and if I don't even know if it's possible to leave the neighborhood right now. <laughs> you know, the first thing I'll do is probably go see Jasminder's mother. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely have plans uh, to visit Pakistan again. Uh, my next book is, is predominantly about law, so I hope to be able to release it there at some point. So until we're, we're hitting about 90 minutes on this. We, we traditionally close at 6.30 UK time just to uh, give people back their evening. But this has been extraordinary. And we've had everyone pretty well stay online. Why don't you tell us about your, tell us about your next book. Tell us what you're working on right now. So you just hinted at it there. Um, okay, so I can't, I actually, it's embarrassing. I can't disclose too much about it, but I will you give you a very broad uh, sweeping theme. Um, it is about a family from Lahore who is impacted by World War I, World War II, and partition. And I know this gives nothing at all, but what I will say now will be far more interesting. And this is the best platform to say this. The third book I'm working on is on Punjabis, is on Punjabi culture, Punjabi heritage, not Punjab, but Punjabis, the people. And what I would love is because ordinarily I would be out there in the field talking to people, traveling around Indian and Pakistani Punjab, but because of COVID and because of the restrictions we have on travel, I would love to hear people's stories. Um, make the best of, make the best of this, this situation, I guess. So if you have a story about literally anything interesting in your family, about Punjabi myth, legend, folklore, dance, music, fulkari, Ranjit Singh, anything. I would love to hear it. And of course, I'm still collecting stories of objects from partition. So, yeah. But the Punjabis is a book I'm actually very interested in working on because I have never lived in Punjab. Um, I'm from Delhi. Uh, as embarrassing as it is to admit on this forum, I don't speak great Punjabi either. Uh, so this is also an endeavor to sort of understand what it means to be Punjabi outside the regions of Punjab. You know, who are Punjabi people? So I'm, I'm looking for stories. Well, I think you're going to get a fantastic uh, response to all of that. And we, as you know, are a completely open book, but a fantastic uh, network. And we'll do everything that we can to support you. you. Because that sounds like not just a fascinating book, but also a much needed 
uh, book because it's not really been done. Uh, yeah, I, know. I think that um, a Punjab unencumbered by borders, you know, just about the people, different religions, different geographic areas, the diaspora. Um, yeah, and it's it's very it's a very big endeavor as well, actually. Well, we're, we're right behind you, and I think you've got a very active uh, readership online at the moment. Look, let me, uh, let me just express the gratitude of everybody that's joined today, and thank you so much for your conversation today. You have educated us. You've transported us back to 1947. You brought tears to our, to our eyes. I wish you all the very best with that. I hope we'll see you, hear you again um, on this, actually, but thank you so much. I also want to thank my team, um, Hardy, Kamal, Avi, and Shamneet Sheffield, who joined us recently, and is, is helping out. So thank you very much for that. If you're online now, please just have a quick look at the chat window. There's a survey there. Please do click on that. It's literally 15 seconds to, uh, to fill in, and it's uh, enormously helpful to us. But once again, Anshul, thank you so much. And oh, and I should thank also Kavita Puri. Kavita's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I can't believe how many people are listening. Thank you so much. Um, Amin, thank you. It's such a huge platform. Thank you so much. I am very, very grateful. Not at all. Not at all. It's been an absolute privilege uh, to be with you today. Um, everyone, thank you very much. and look forward to seeing and um, hearing from most of you uh, next week with Anita and Anand. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys.